the island of Bohol in the central Philippines. What was once a rich fishing area has become severely depleted. Local fishermen now seek a large part of their income from fishing for one of nature's most extraordinary creatures, the seahorse. Now the seahorse too is under threat from overfishing. Since 1995, the world's leading authority on seahorses, Dr. Amanda Vincent, has been running the first ever seahorse conservation project in the village of Han Dumon. The reason we came to the Philippines derives directly from an electronic billboard which said that seahorses are becoming one of the most valuable exports from the Philippines used to help men with weak tails. Um, but the translation, I gather, is a little bit different from that. So that motivated us when we had a choice of which country to begin, uh, where to begin our trade work, motivated us to choose the Philippines because we had very few other clues. <laughs> Seahorses are easy prey. When they're threatened, they hold on ever more tightly, leaving the fisher to simply pry their tails loose and pick them up by hand. A species that is almost 40 million years old could be in danger of vanishing. Many of the seahorses pass through the village's main shop, destined for sale abroad. Now we've seen that she has about two and a half kilos of seahorses in here. That represents about two weeks fishing at the moment. Uh, it used to be that 250 seahorses would be about one kilo, but the seahorses have become a lot smaller largely because the bigger ones have been fished off and they're now fishing off other seahorses before they reach a really large size. As a consequence, I think they get about 300 per kilo now. I don't know, it gives you a sense of the rate at which we're depleting the numbers of large seahorses. I became very interested in seahorses because in seahorses only the male gets pregnant. I'm intrigued by the evolution of sex differences. It was in doing this fundamental research that I started seeing piles of seahorses like this and began to bit, get fairly concerned about what this meant. Most of these seahorses are used for traditional Chinese medicine and one of the issues of concern is we don't want there to be any pregnant males in this pile of seahorses because it means their young die unnecessarily too. So for example, we like seeing a seahorse like this because it's already given birth before it was sold. So you can see the pouches are actually empty there, as opposed to the ones where we've still goofed up. This one still has young in its pouch when it was sold. Both Amanda and the villagers often do important work at night, studying and guarding the seahorses until dawn. The sanctuary was implemented just over three years ago now and has proven a roaring success with really quite rapid recovery of both the corals and the fishes. Uh, the villagers go out at night on a periodic basis and patrol in a fairly fast outrigger boat. And every night, Nong Renning and Nang Meli spend the night here uh, with a powerful spotlight, just making sure that anybody who comes into the sanctuary is picked up by the spotlight to warn them that somebody's watching. And then they have a radio. They can radio the barangay captain if they need help. So it works fairly successfully and makes for a long night for them, however, so they'd be aching to get home for breakfast about now. This is an open access fishery, which means that everybody in the region is competing for the same resources. And although our fishers know that they should leave behind the pregnant males, and they should leave behind the juveniles to grow and mature, if they did that, other villagers would take them. As a consequence then, people from Handumon, when they catch pregnant males, now put them in the cage. They then give birth in that cage and their young escape through the mesh to repopulate the wild. And in the corral, the juveniles are reared for about four or five months, doubling in size and doubling in value. During that period, they start reproducing and their young escape through the mesh as in the pregnant male cage. 
The fishermen now cooperate with Amanda and routinely bring her their daily catch of seahorses to help the ongoing scientific study of the local seahorse populations before selling them on. Zero, lucky. The village took a while to become confident about our motives. At first, they suggested we were communists because we kept asking about their economic status. And then they thought that I was in it for the money and I was actually a merchant who was going to steal their goods at very low prices. There were rumors that we were seeking gold because we were diving at night and apparently a lot of Japanese vessels sank during the Second World War laden with gold here. So it took about six months before there was a sense of confidence that we were exactly what we claimed to be and we're trying to work with them to improve resource management. In order to help the community to reduce its reliance on seahorse fishing, Dr. Vincent is encouraging the villagers to develop their traditional handicraft skills as an alternative income. Last year we held a marine art competition to identify skills in the village and Nong Jo got second prize with his seahorse outrigger boats. And his wife, when asked recently what difference it had made to them, said she just thanked God every day that now they could afford a new roof and they could also afford to send three children to school. <laughs> the fishers here have used these small goggles for a very long time. They are made of wood with glass that he just files with a knife. A number of visitors who came here were struck by their decorative value as well. If you look at them, they're quite striking with their telephone wire type cords. And he now paints them in really cheerful, bright colors. So a lot of visitors find them an amazing record of their time in the island. A major new part of Amanda's work is to encourage the young to think about conservation through a school scholarship program. In return for having school fees paid, the children spend time with the Seahorse Project, learning about conservation. At the moment, uh, we've got a number of the scholars each telling about a particular habitat, and this particular scholar is talking about seagrasses and what lives in seagrasses and how you can protect seagrasses. The chap before was talking about mangroves, and one of the others will talk about corals and destructive fishing techniques and so on. We try always to take seahorses as the thread for our work because they allow us really to tackle almost every conservation issue. Amanda has already achieved a great deal on her own. The Rolex Award will allow her to continue for two more years with a project which has become the focus of her life. I feel this is one of my homes and I'm always really happy when I'm here. It can be a bit difficult at times because I'm also juggling international projects from here and the telecommunications are not fantastic on Handumon. But there are compensations. You get to watch people growing and gaining confidence in new skills. You get to know you're making a difference most of the time you're here. Uh, and it's a pretty lovely set of people to work with in a very important marine environment. And that's what I'm trained to do and wanting to do. A local form of poetry practiced here is called Balak. Uh, it was a dying art and we've been trying to encourage its revival in the form of environmental Balak. It's very declamatory, very meaningful. This poem by Nong Renning Padden won this year's Environmental Day competition. <laughs> In the seas we find the beautiful reefs, never to be ravaged. The seahorse holds to healthy corals, born their joys to exult. Through to the shores I saw the bountiful mangrove trees, and lo, the fishes feasted on the shade of the mangrove trees. The end. Kay dumidang